Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am delighted to welcome you to our Munich Dialogues on Democracy evening with Nina Jankowitz about how to lose the information war uh, around Russia, fake news, and the future of conflict. The COVID-19 pandemic has moved our events online for now, and I'm thankful that we can continue to bring English language events with brilliant speakers to our community using virtual technology. I'm Bartley Grosserichter. I'm the founder of Munich Dialogues on Democracy. And uh, this is a cooperation with the Yale Club of Germany and Munich's America House, the Bavarian Center for Transatlantic Relations. I'd like to start by thanking our members, donors, and supporters for making these events possible. We're really grateful for your continued support and we'll continue to pursue our goals for our community in these uncertain times. And while I miss the energy of our in-person events, being virtual does have a very concrete advantage in that we can welcome an audience from around the world. So tonight or today, depending on where you're joining from, I'd like to give a special shout out to our friends at Yale clubs all over Europe, as well as to the Yale alumni community around the world. A warm welcome also to the community from Amsterdam's John Adams Institute with whom we are happy to reciprocate for online events. And specific to tonight, a special welcome to our cooperation partner, the Hans Seidel Foundation here in Munich. I met Nina a few years ago when she gave an excellent presentation on disinformation at America House. Uh, we stayed in touch and I'm thrilled that she's accepted our invitation to return to Munich, albeit virtually. Nina studies the intersection of democracy and technology in Central and Eastern Europe at the Wilson Center's disinformation, as the Wilson Center's disinformation fellow. She has advised the Ukrainian government on strategic communications under the auspices of a Fulbright Fellowship. You may have seen her writing in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Politico, the Atlantic, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review. And she's testified before Congress and is a frequent radio and television commentator on disinformation and Russian and Eastern European affairs. In her new book, Nina reports from the front lines of the information war in Central and Eastern Europe on five governments' responses to disinformation campaigns, Estonia, Georgia, Poland, Ukraine, and the Czech Republic, and then relates all of that back to what's going on in the United States also. Um, she journeys into campaigns run by Russian and domestic operatives and shows how we can better understand the motivations behind these attacks and how to beat them. It's truly a rich slice of what it's like on the ground in these countries through personal experience. And I, for me, I can say I, I really enjoyed reading it. It's a great read on top of being um, very meaty and full of fantastic information. Um, what Nina says is at stake is above all for her is the future of civil discourse and democracy and the value of truth itself. When domestic disinformers employ the very same tactics as international criminals to attack our elections, she says we shouldn't only be angry, we should fight back. So Nina, welcome to Munich Dialogues on Democracy. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, Bartley. Super. I'd also like to introduce our moderator for this evening. Andrea Rotta heads the Foreign and Security Policy Division at the Hans Seidel Foundation's Academy for Politics and Current Affairs here in Munich, where she focuses on both German and European security and defense policy, as well as transatlantic security cooperation. In 2018, Andrea was a fellow with the American German Situation Room of the German Marshall Fund and the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies of the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC. Uh, she's a member of the Young Leaders in Security Policy, which is the three-year program of the Federal Academy for Security Policy here in Germany. And she serves as a board member of Women in International Security Studies, heading the regional chapter here in Munich. One of her new projects is called Challenges in the Age of Disinformation. So she is perfectly suited to lead the conversation tonight and I'm very glad she should join. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you for having me and thanks for bringing me into this event at all. Thank you. Super, thank you very much. Finally, what I'd like to say, I hope everybody has their time zone appropriate beverage to enjoy the evening. You can ask questions during the conversation on the YouTube live page or via email to program at americahouse.de. Please let me spell it, it's in German. P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M at A-M-E-R-I-K-A-H-A-U-S dot D-E. My fantastic partners over there are directing the technical aspect of tonight. 
and they'll be field fielding questions for us as well. And we'll try to get to as many as possible in the one hour that we have. So with that, Andrea, I'm very happy to turn it over to you and Nina. Thanks. And thanks, Bartley, for the kind introduction and for getting in touch with me for this event. As Bartley has mentioned, we at the Hansaidl Foundation also deal with disinformation and have launched a new project in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic in which we seek to find answers and develop strategies for Germany to better deal with the widespread information. So I literally jumped at the opportunity to talk to Nina Jankovic, who is a true expert on this and well known beyond the borders of the US. So, once again, many thanks, Bartley and Dominic from the America House to let me and the Hans Eidel Foundation be a part of this. But now let's start with Nina and her book. First of all, Nina, congratulations on your book, which is a truly wonderful read in terms of both the information and the facts that you provide and the personal accounts that enrich your storyline. I can really recommend to everyone who is interested um, in this important topic of this information to buy and read the book. Nina is not just an expert, but a truly gifted author as well. Thank um, you. <laughs> sure, no pleasure. It's just telling the truth, actually. I really <laughs> enjoyed reading it. It was fantastic. But before we delve into the uh, specific of Russian information, let's talk about the motivation for writing this book. What did inspire you to write this book? Because when I remember correctly, it took you about three years of hard work and research into this book to actually write it, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you so much to America House, to Munich Dialogues on Democracy, to the Hans Seidel Foundation uh, for being here with us today and for having me and giving me this opportunity. It's great. Of course, I wish I were with you in person, but as it stands, very, very happy that we're gathered here in this virtual environment. Um, I really gained the, the motivation to write this book and had the idea first when I was in Ukraine. I was working, as Bartley mentioned, as a strategic communications advisor to the foreign ministry of Ukraine, uh, to the spokesperson there, when um, the 2016 election happened. And I had had uh, several years of experience, both in of course, in my, my degrees, I did two degrees in Russian and East European studies. And then uh, in work that I, I started my career after graduate school in uh, the democracy support field at the National Democratic Institute here in Washington, working on programs in Russia and Belarus. So the idea of disinformation wasn't new uh, to me, at least, or to my colleagues in the Russia washer space. Um, but when the revelations about the 2016 election and Russian election interference came to light here in the United States. Watching that from Ukraine was almost surreal. Um, it, it, was, it was not obvious, I think, to everyone that Russia was interfering in the election, but it was obvious that Russia has these tools in its toolkit and is not afraid to use them. Um, and for some reason, it seemed to me like the reaction of Americans and the reaction of the West writ large to Russian interference was something like, oh, this has never happened before. We're so surprised this is happening. What do we do about it? Um, and I was every day living with the, the realities and the consequences of Russian information warfare as I worked with my colleagues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and saw what else was happening around Europe. And I knew, you know, for instance, that Estonia had experienced this sort of thing way back in 2007. And here we were at that point, almost 10 years later, um, as if, you know, this was something completely new and we had never experienced it before. We also know that, you know, Russia or the Soviet Union had used these tactics during the Soviet period as well. Of course, they look a little bit different now. So it was my intention with this book to, to shed some light on what our allies in Central and Eastern Europe had learned about this problem, the pitfalls of certain responses what the best practices were, but also to tell these stories, because I think in the West, we have a certain hubris about what Central and Eastern Europe can teach us, you know, thinking of them as new Europe or new members of, you know, international structures like the EU and NATO. But in reality, in, in some ways, they're way more prepared to deal with threats like these and, and way uh, more, you know, clear eyed about the threat that they pose. Um, so that was the idea. And, you know, as I as I wrote the book, um, especially as I was finishing it up last summer, um, the and the Mahler report was published at the same time, uh, the parallels between some of the things in the domestic situations that were happening in the book as I finished it up in places like Poland and Georgia to what was happening in the United States, what is happening in the United States now are greater than I really expected. And I, um, especially with the pandemic, I think this is, 
a perfect time for the book to come out, besides the fact that I would love to be traveling around and interacting with all of you in person. Um, there's so much disinformation right now, and it's a great teachable moment so that we can really write our ship um, and, and make sure that, you know, things don't get worse um, from now on. As you said, it's it's a perfect timing, and I pray, I'm really grateful that you know this information finally gets the spotlight, also here in Germany and also in Europe. There's actually um, so let's get back to the premise of the book. So the premise of your book, as you just mentioned, is that this information and especially Russia's use of it is not a new phenomenon. But it has been employed various times in history, and as you stated in recent history, we and by we I mean the US and especially Western Europe does not really care to look closely enough. Only as you mentioned, perhaps with Russia's annexation of Crimea, but definitely with the 2016 presidential election, we started to wake up, right? So even now, several years later, we still don't seem to know what we're really talking about. And throughout the book, you lament the fact that we actually don't have a common understanding and a shared definition of disinformation, but we often even speak the same language. Um, so according to you, what are we talking about actually? Or in other words, or what should we be talking about when we talk about this information? Sure. So one of the things that I had a little bit of a fight with my publisher about, fight is a, is a strong word, we had a discussion, uh, is the subtitle of the book, which is Russia, Fake News in the Future of Conflict. Um, I really didn't want fake news to be in the title because I personally don't use that term. Uh, I think especially with politicians who have kind of grappled onto that term as something that they can use in their political arsenal whenever there is a press article that is less than uh, complimentary about them, they call it fake news. And, and, you know, the president of the United States is one of the leaders who does that. So do Jarosław Kaczynski in Poland and Viktor Orban in Hungary, Duterte in the Philippines, Bolsonaro in Brazil. This is a trend. Um, so I really didn't want that term in there because I think there's there's a lot of misconceptions surrounding it, especially here in America. People tend to think that fake news means something that is a cut and dry fake, either a fake website or a fake account. When in reality, most of the disinformation that is really successful is grounded in some sort of real visceral truth, whether that is uh, malinformation, that is, you know, fake or uh, documents that are hacked and then leaked. Um, so stuff that wouldn't have been public otherwise and then is put into the public. So as happened with the hack of the Democratic uh, National Committee in 2016, or whether it's just seizing on societal fissures that exist in order to drive uh, divisiveness in society. And that, I think, is what we're seeing a lot right now in the United States around the coronavirus pandemic, around uh, the George Floyd protests and, and racial inequality here in the United States. Um, and that's the key misconception about disinformation and why people call it, you know, fake news. Disinformation is false or misleading information that's shared with malign intent. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is totally untrue. It can be misleading or just emotional, just a different kind of spin on a topic uh, that, you know, we are, we would be talking about anyway. Um, but it's, it's got that malign intent behind it. And that's different from misinformation, of course, which is false or misleading information that doesn't have that malign intent. That might be something that one of your family members shares when they're forwarding a chain email or sharing a meme online. That's misinformation. But there's been a real lack of precision about what we mean when we're talking about this, not only in the media. You know, I've heard many media reports here in the United States that refer to things that are actually disinformation as misinformation. And in fact, the social media platforms also perpetuate this. Facebook itself refers to the entire information phenomenon as misinformation, even though there is intent behind a lot of these campaigns. I guess Facebook doesn't want to ascribe that intent, which is problematic in and of itself. Um, but as a result, we have a very confused population. You know, we have people saying that fake news is for political purposes and don't recognize it as a threat. And then we have all these different words being used. So that results in, you know, people not really recognizing that this is not only a threat to our national security, which is kind of an amorphous topic for most Americans or most citizens of any country, but a threat, you know, to public safety and public health at times like this. Um, so we really need to do some awareness building around that. And especially in the media and kind of um, public sector, be very precise about our language and say what we mean when we're talking about this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
And I hope that in this event and in this book certainly help you know to add more precision to the debate is that we have the same phenomenon in Germany and in Europe that we um, that we really you know don't carefully enough apply these terms. So hopefully this event is certainly a good opportunity to add more precision. Okay, so in your book, you, as Bartley mentioned, you look at five examples of where Russia employed its tactic, um, Estonia, Georgia, Poland. One case I found very interesting was the Netherlands and the disinformation surrounding the referendum on the EU's association agreement with Ukraine, which I find so interesting because basically you had the Ukrainians um, fighting disinformation outside their own borders. So that was something I really enjoyed um, or certain point of view I didn't really think about. And lastly, you talk about the Czech Republic, which of all countries became, as you call them, a leader of information warriors, although uh, it certainly cannot be considered a front state in the, in the traditional sense. We will certainly look at some examples of your places later on in more depth. But let's first about let's first talk about Russia. So you look at these cases to analyze this, Russia carried out these information campaigns, um, how they affected countries and how the respective government responded to it. So how does Russian information work? You spoke about misconceptions we have in the United States and also in Europe about Russia's information. So what do we got right about information? What do we got wrong when it comes to the logics and workings of information? In our societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the first thing is what I mentioned before about the difference between cut and dry fakes and these kind of emotionally manipulative tactics. That's what we see more and more these days. And that's what people really need to watch out for. You know, during the coronavirus pandemic, I've been um, calling for people to practice what I call informational distancing. So that if you feel yourself getting emotional reading a piece of content, you should stop and ask yourself why. Is, is someone deliberately trying to manipulate you? And maybe, you know, put your device down, close your laptop, walk away and think about that before you hit share. Um, we really need to reprogram ourselves in that regard. And that's true whether disinformation is a foreign phenomenon or whether it's proliferating in our own societies. So that's the first thing. The second thing about Russia that's important to understand is that some of the stuff that they did wasn't really even about disinformation. Uh, it wasn't false. It, so when we look at things like the Mueller report and the um, the campaigns that happened in the lead up to the 2016 election, uh, there's a lot of kind of positive community building that went on in order to change people's behavior. So an example that I love to give is uh, from what was called the Being Patriotic Facebook page. It was this kind of patriotic, jingoistic, right-wing page targeted at folks who really loved Americana. Uh, there was all sorts of flag uh, paraphernalia and things like this shared there. Um, and early on in this page's existence, probably in around 2014, 2015 or so, uh, they shared a meme of a dog, a golden retriever, very handsome golden retriever with an, a bandana that was red and white, it had stars on it. And he was holding between his paws a, a little American flag. It was probably Photoshopped very poorly, but, um, and it said on the meme, uh, like if you think it's going to be a great week. Nothing about that is false or misleading. It's just a meme with a dog on it. Everyone loves dogs uh, and animals online. Um, and memes like this were shared over time to kind of generate community and trust so that when pages like Being Patriotic asked their followers to change their profile picture in support of a cause, or sign a petition or show up to a protest, which these pages did organize. I think that's a big misconception. People don't realize that this actually, you know, caused people to show up to protests that wouldn't have otherwise uh, done so. Um, they were more likely to trust that vector of information. And so it's important to recognize that community building aspect. Um, but then other than that, you know, I think there's a big misconception about the fact that Russian disinformation and, and the Russian information warfare strategy in general doesn't really have scruples in terms of politics. You know, we think about Soviet propaganda, that was to build up the image and the politics of the Soviet Union and support for the Soviet Union. Russian disinformation of today is spread out across the political spectrum. 
Here in the United States, we've seen it support candidates on the left and the right uh, and any other you know, configuration thereof, as long as it is pitting us against each other. Um, and in other societies, you know, for instance, in Estonia, there might only be one fisher that they are uh, that they're manipulating, you know, the ethnic fissure between ethnic Russians and ethnic Estonians. Um, but in, in larger societies, you know, there's a lot of different flashpoints for, for Russia to use. And the idea isn't to support one political uh, ideology or one political candidate. Again, it is to cause that division, to make us look inward, to cause distraction and dismay, and ultimately to get us to disengage with the democratic process. Democracy requires participation, but when you have this storm of information that you're trying to find your way out of, um, some people just throw up their hands and say, you know what, I've had enough. And they're not going to go out and ask questions to consume information or to be informed voters. Some of them might not vote at all. Um, and that's the ultimate goal. It's not just to convince you of something that you might not have thought before. In fact, it isn't that at all. It's to play on those pre-existing emotions and um, predilections that you have and and weaponize those in order to get you to to stop engaging with the democratic process. So you mentioned it's that um, Russian tactics not just differ in its objectives but also in the way uh, they applied and I think lots of people um, think about when they um, talk about this information as you mentioned just in the online realm, in the, on the internet realm, right? But uh, as you mentioned, um, this information can have impact on real life, calling out for rallies, as you mentioned, or, or engaging or simply not going to vote or, or as you said, disengage from the democratic process at all. Uh, one thing I'm personally interested in, and this is something also you talk about in your book, is that we put much belief in strategic communications, in good communications that we think if we have some kind of a counter narrative that we can juxtapose to the Russian information or information informed um, narrative, then this will solve all of our problems. But it's not that easy, is it? No, no. And I say this as a former, former uh, strategic communications advisor, you know, so, so often, I think we're getting a little bit away from this now, thank goodness. But especially early on, as we grappled with the disinformation problem, um, pretty much at every conference I went to, people would just say, you know, we just need a good narrative. We need a new narrative for NATO. We need, a, we need to really express to people what the EU stands for. Uh, frankly, I never heard anyone say that we need a new narrative for the United States, but I think it's clear now now with everything going on that we we do need to think about our image in the rest of the world and, and how our actions here at home are projected abroad. Uh, but at the time, no one was talking about that. Hopefully there is more understanding about it. But still, um, it, it's impossible, I think, to, to really just uh, to, to message your way out of the crisis of truth and trust that we are facing. Um, it's You can't just tell a nice story and undo uh, you know, years of learned behavior and learned kind of prejudices, um, because these are based in, in people's real life experiences. So that's what's so interesting about the Ukraine case study um, that you mentioned before. So uh, in case the, the viewers aren't, aren't familiar, the, the Netherlands held a referendum on Ukraine's association agreement with the EU in 2016. Of course, the association agreement was the reason uh, that the Euromaidan revolution happened because the former president, Viktor Yanukovych, had reneged on that agreement to pursue further integration with Russia. Ukrainians were, were not happy about that, um, hence the protests. So this was a very um, emotional issue for Ukrainians. And uh, Russia saw an opportunity in this referendum, not only to undermine Ukraine's support in the international community, but to undermine EU cohesion. Uh, because as, as Dutch viewers will know, who I understand we have some of, there's a lot of Euroscepticism in the Netherlands. Um, and especially with the MH17 tragedy, the, the anniversary of which uh, was just last week, um, many of the, the folks killed in that shoot down were, were Dutch citizens. And so there was kind of a preconceived opinion of, of what was going on in Ukraine. There was already some question about Ukraine's culpability in the MH17 shoot down, even though all of the evidence points to a Russian missile that was used by uh, Russian supported separatists in, in the Donbass. 
Um, but again, Ukraine was viewed as this corrupt kind of war-torn nation that the, the Dutch population didn't want integrated into, uh, into the EU economically. And so Russia used uh, all of those fissures in order to spread a story about, um, spread and amplify, I would say, a story about Ukrainian corruption, about Ukrainian terrorists, et cetera. That made its way from Russian publications like RT and Sputnik into the Dutch mainstream. And frankly, those ideas were already there uh, to begin with. And Ukraine tried to launch a plucky little strategic communications campaign that was very positive and talked about, you know, uh, Dutch-Ukraine relations, all of the exchanges between the populations, mutually beneficial economic agreements and things like that. Uh, and it just could not gain traction because that, that you know, deep-seated Euroscepticism and that distrust of Ukraine was quite strong in the population to begin with, and Russia helped it along. So we, we really have to be careful about, you know, putting all of our eggs in the storytelling basket. I think we also need to look at the resiliency of the population, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we certainly do. But in this context, I really liked one, ten one sentence that you wrote is that when we want to fight this information, we have to look at victims rather than the perpetrators in the first place. If we really, as you mentioned, want to build up some kind of resiliency. And I think uh, one country that got it pretty well in this regard was Estonia. So perhaps we can now go back to, uh, to some of the test cases you analyzed. Um, and Estonia, um, well, it served as a real test case for Russia's disinformation toolkit as early as you mentioned as 2007, and which despite its relative small size and population still stands out as a front runner on successfully dealing with this disinformation. So what did you find special about the, the approach of the Estonian government and the Estonian society? Um, how did they deal with disinformation and what can we, and I say the West possibly learn from it? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Estonia is a really interesting example because they clearly have this military threat. They have this exigent threat on their border from Russia being a huge neighbor. Um, and Russia did weaponize, as I mentioned before, the, the ethnic fissures between ethnic Russians and ethnic Estonians that existed after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Ethnic Russians had some real grievances against the Estonian government in terms of uh, their rights in society that weren't quite equal to their Estonian um, kind of uh, co-residents. Um, many Russian population folks, members of the Russian population didn't have Estonian citizenship because they couldn't speak Estonian. Uh, they didn't have the same sort of opportunities for education and career advancement. Um, so there were some real grievances that, that Russia seized upon. And there is a long story in the book about how Russia also used this monument, the bronze soldier, as a flashpoint for all of this. But we don't need to go into that now. Um, in terms of responses, I think what's important is after all of these, the, the riot broke out, there was a, a cyber attack also associated with this campaign. Estonia realized that, you know, we have a, a problem on our hands, uh, that, you know, our internal weaknesses are being used against us. Um, and so they began to really invest in people. It wasn't just about better cyber defenses. It wasn't just about, you know, more investment in NATO. It was about education, uh, providing better educational opportunities for uh, for Russian speaking citizens. It was about uh, media, making sure that there was Russian language media that could compete with what was being uh, projected from across the border. And it was also about just basic integration and outreach activities. So for instance, I love this example, in 2018, the Estonian government actually took kind of a sabbatical and moved uh, the presidential administration for a little bit to Narva, which is a Russian speaking city in order to say to that population, you know, we hear you, we, we are here for you, we want to um, have a presence with you. When um, before that, you know, they had felt kind of ignored. And I, I like to think about what that would look like in the United States. Would it be, you know, uh, parts of the U.S. government moving to places in America's heartland or in the South or in the in the West, what would it look like? Would it be possible um, to, to be able to do that sort of outreach? I think that's really an interesting example. Obviously, much easier for a country like Estonia, which only has 1.3 million people in it, but not something that we should discount because these are generational campaigns. Russia, uh, Estonia started these investments in 2007, really doubled down on them after uh, the invasion of Crimea and annexation of Crimea and uh, occupation of the Donbass in, in 2014. But, uh, you know, the, the benefits are really becoming clear now as more Russian ethnic citizens are being um, 
further integrated into Estonian society and adopting a Estonian European identity as opposed to kind of a, a Russian quasi, you know, straddling the border uh, identity that they had had before. Mm -hmm. And along these lines is, um, again, one of my most favorite quotes of the book, and it was really eye opening was um, that we in the West and certainly also in the United States, that we like to define disinformation as a problem that is being done to us rather than the weaponization of our own weaknesses. And this is something, um, as you explained, apparently the Estonians understood and tried to to counter with their outreach programs and all their um, you know, initiatives to finally include and integrate all these people. Um, on the one side, and this brings me to the next um, example, because we just have so much limited time and I want to integrate um, much of the, or most of the interesting um, aspects into our discussion is that apparently Poland is a country that took a different road and um, you explain it in your book, and this is also um, why Poland for us here in Europe, but certainly in the United States, is such an interesting example, because um, Poland obviously offers many similarities to the US, but also um, they assess themselves as, and you said it, inoculated against Russian disinformation, meaning that they think that they are well aware of the threat and consider them also consider themselves well prepared against Russian tactics. Um, yet the government doesn't seem to take according action. Could you explain a little bit about the, the, the similarities perhaps to the United States and also um, why um, the, the, the policies the Pol Polish government has undertaken might have even the opposite of effect of what it has actually um, desired to do in terms of disinformation. Sure, yeah, the, the Polish example um, is one that's really interesting to me, of course, a little bit sad for me to watch. I, I have Polish heritage myself. Um, and so since I started dealing with this topic, every time I went to Poland, Poles were like, no, no, we don't have a Russian disinformation problem. If anybody recognizes the Russian threat, it's us. And that's true. If you look at their national security documents and things like that, it, they're very clear about the threat that is posed by the Russian Federation. Uh, unfortunately, their own internal divisions are exactly what is what is you know, um, manipulated by Russia. Um, around the Smolensk plane crash, for instance, there is a lot of disinformation around Ukrainian migrants who have come to Poland to work uh, and, and drive taxi cabs and work um, thanks to the EU visa free travel. A lot of them are going to Poland. There's a lot of disinformation around that, along with Ukraine, Poland history around World War II and things like that. All of these things, these very difficult moments in society are being weaponized by Russian disinformation and also by a lot of the media in Poland. The problem is, uh, despite this clear-eyed assessment of the threat that Russia poses, Poland itself is engaging in some disinformation against its own citizens, particularly the Law and Justice Party has, has been shown to uh, have hired troll factories and things like this. Um, there's an Oxford Internet Institute report from 2017 that um, demonstrates how right-wing accounts are used in astroturfing and brigading operations online um, in order to create a guise of support for government activities. Um, the law and justice government has also taken control of the public broadcaster in Poland, which means that they basically have a propaganda mouthpiece of their own. Um, and all of these adjustments, if you want to call them that, to the, to the media scene mean that Polish polarization is, is hastened, is you know, increased by the, the, the ruling party. Um, and also that these, these um, instruments of power inadvertently you know, um, mirroring the tactics that, that Russia uses on Poland and other countries, not only the tactics, but the narratives as well. Just uh, this past week during the election campaign in Poland, we saw a lot of narratives uh, you know, directed at the opposition and the opposition candidate, Rafał Czeskowski, about foreign interests in the media. So talking about German-owned and American-owned media that were supporting Czeskowski, um, all of these things. Uh, that are, you know, very, very much echoing a lot of the Russian disinformation narratives around 
uh, George Soros and foreign owned publications, foreign owned operatives uh, in societies like this. So basically, even though the, the Polish government has this very cogent national security doctrine that lays out the threat against Russia or that Russia poses to Poland, um, because of their own actions, all of that is, is undercut. They've got some very good people working on these issues in their government. But the message that comes from Polish leadership is that disinformation is okay if we're doing it, basically, which is a very similar situation to the, what, we're, what we're dealing with here in the United States right now. Um, there are some brilliant people across the federal government working on these issues, but it has never been important enough for President Trump to recognize um, the threat that disinformation poses. And we see some of the same tactics being used in US politics. Uh, we also see the politicization of the issue, calling it a witch hunt, um, you know, not, not acknowledging uh, that disinformation is a, is a bedrock threat to our democracy. Um, and I think in that way, Poland is a very instructive case study. Uh, and, and there's a lot more rich detail in the book. So if any of our viewers today are interested in, in the current political situation in Poland, I would encourage them to check that chapter out in particular. Okay, thank you. So, um, I mean, we will come to talk to um, about the situation in the, in the States in a minute um, and the politicization of the of disinformation and how it actually um, prevents uh, from government, but also the whole society um, to have an effective response to, uh, to disinformation. But let us first have a look at the last test case or the last example I would like to draw um, our attention to. And this is the Czech Republic. And um, as you said to yourself, or as they think of them themselves, um, um, the Czech Republic um, considers it a leader of the information warriors uh, when it established the so-called center against terrorism and hybrid threats. So basically they established the first governmental institution of this kind in the world. But when you actually know about the background, it's not really kind of funny, but it's not something that you would come to think of when you think about disinformation. So could you ex uh, elaborate a little bit on the background of this new hub on terrorism and um, counter disinformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting case study. And this is one that I remember when the center was announced when I was living in Ukraine and I was, I was, I saw it and I was like, oh man, it's another center because there had been several like international uh, bodies established at that point. And um, it, it became really a pattern that, you know, when you wanted to fight disinformation, you would create a new center and that everyone thought that's going to solve all the problems. Um, but what it really shows is how, uh, especially from the higher levels of government, these efforts can be undercut if there isn't support at the top levels. And it also shows that, you know, this needs to be a whole of government solution and it can't be um, all concentrated in one, one spot. So a brief history of the center, which again has a lot more detail and color from some very interesting characters in the book. Um, basically the Czech Republic realized it had a disinformation problem during the migrant crisis. Uh, even though the Czech Republic was taking very, very few migrants, there was a ton of disinformation proliferating about how uh, Muslim migrants were going to make sure that you know, Czech children couldn't eat pork at school, which of course would be total blasphemy in any country in Central Europe, right? Um, there, there were a lot of narratives like this that were, were very kind of silly, but, but they were taking off on fringe media sites that may have some either Russian editorial oversight or perhaps Russian funding. There's still a lot of research uh, happening about this. Um, and so the, the Czech government decided, okay, clearly this is a problem. It's, it's especially a problem because it deals with this, this migrant crisis and terrorism. Terrorism is a better issue for us to message around rather than disinformation here in the, in the Czech Republic because disinformation deals with freedom of speech and we hold on to that very, very you know, dearly uh, after our communist experience. So let's brand this as the Center Against Terrorism and Hybrid Threats. Uh, hybrid threats being another one of those words that's just kind of thrown around willy nilly in the disinformation space, uh, basically meaning, you know, the, the combination of informational and regular kinetic warfare. So uh, the, the center was created within the Ministry of Interior, which has uh, the, you know, portfolio of terrorism and of immigration issues. And when they were announced, there was a lot of fanfare about them. You know, they were going to be doing a lot of fact checking related to their portfolio uh, and also kind of monitoring the disinformation space um, around these issues. 
But uh, it soon became clear that the president um, was not particularly happy with this arrangement because it turned out that he was the source of a lot of disinformation, particularly about, about immigration uh, and you know, uh, Muslim folks in, in the Czech Republic. So he attacked the center and they kind of had this back and forth of uh, whether you know, there was utility in the center existing. The president uh, also lambasted the center. Many people spoke out saying that they didn't want to have a censor in the Czech Republic uh, because they had you know, fought so long for their right to free speech. Um, and it just goes to show that creating things like this, you know, it's a good step toward building awareness, but you have to be very careful about the messaging toward the public. You have to be transparent about what it is that you're doing. And that buy-in from the highest levels of government is really important because otherwise it can stymie your work or in a worst case scenario, even shut down that work. And the center is doing important stuff. They're training civil servants on how to recognize disinformation, how to fight back against disinformation. But unfortunately, kind of the branding of the center got a little bit ahead of itself and meant that its own work was undermined at least for the first couple of years. And now they kind of operate under the radar. Uh, so one thing you mentioned or uh, one thing you alluded to uh, was the fine line between fighting disinformation and debunking on the one side and the freedom of expression and fears of censorship on the other. Um, because for these reasons, the center itself had first to win support from the Czech Republic um, or from the Czech population, didn't they? And I, I know we have we have had similar debates here in Germany, whether we need some kind of a government uh, fact checking um, institution located within our Ministry of Interior or even within the Chancellery. But um, finally, you know, in the end, they didn't think that a government institution would be the, um, the, the right institution to address the problem. So what is your take on this fine line? So, you know, um, on the one side, you need to somehow debunk and handle this information, but on the other, you know, you have to distinguish between opinion and facts, right? And the freedom of expression. So what is your take or what you, would be your advice when it comes to this fine line? Yeah, that's a great question. I am not convinced about the utility of fact checking in general. <laughs> I, uh, I've seen many studies and I think it's pretty inconclusive at this point um, from psychological studies dating back to the 70s to um, a few studies about the efficacy of online fact checking uh, here today dealing with, you know, Facebook and things like that. Um, there are some that say, you know, it does change people's minds over time, but there are also others that say, you know, the first time people see a piece of, of incorrect information uh, is the most important kind of interaction they have with that inter information. And even if they see a fact check, their minds are unlikely to be changed afterward. In fact, they might even be more likely to remember the incorrect information, which is a pretty scary thing. So that's about fact checking in general and the efficacy of it. I think it does serve a purpose in the, in the debate. It gives people you know, a resource to turn to if they are trying to quickly verify information. But we've also run into kind of politicized fact checkers as well. This is a case that keeps coming up in Ukraine in particular, where, you know, it, they're not necessarily adhering to uh, the traditional international fact checking codes and norms, um, and that undermines their mission. But leaving that aside, Fact checking does play a role. Should the government be involved in it? I don't think so, personally. Uh, from, from my point of view, which is probably quite an American point of view, this is not uh, a role for the government. It's also not a role for private companies and social media firms, in my opinion. Uh, I, I think the outsourcing approach that Facebook takes, unfortunately, is the right, <laughs> the right approach. I wouldn't want Facebook making those decisions on their own. Uh, but those fact checkers need to be better supported. So right now they don't get very much money. Uh, there's also a wide array of, of different types of quality fact checkers that are involved in Facebook's fact checking program. Uh, some of those politicized fact checkers are involved, even though they don't necessarily, in my opinion, adhere to those standards of, of international fact checking. So I'd like to see the government investing a little bit more in truly nonpartisan fact checkers um, through grant programs and things like that. And that's where we get to the, the question about societal resilience, you know, discussing um, and really investing in generational solutions that help people 
navigate the information environment on their own without having to rely on those fact checkers. Because another thing that we found is that people are more likely to believe something when they come to that conclusion themselves rather than just being told it. So how can we lead people to better information, to more trustworthy information, to be able to really suss out online what they should trust and what perhaps is something that's trying to manipulate them. And that's where media literacy, digital literacy, and civics comes in. Everybody should have those basic skills. And unfortunately, too few people of voting age have those skills right now. Kids are very good at it. Teenagers are very good at it. But if you go from age about 30 and up, we're used to having people who are the gatekeepers, the content moderators there for us. And we need a little bit more, more help in navigating the online information environment. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me ask one more question and address the big elephant in the room, the situation in the United States before we go uh, the, to the Q&A. But as I can see from the, from the questions that have already been um, sent to me, um, most of them, deal with the United States anyway. So um, as you said in your book, Europeans are kind of ahead of the US in countering disinformation. And from a European perspective, especially from a German pers um, perspective, that is nice for a change after always having to look towards US and security and defense matters, right? Um, so from your point of view, how would you assess the current situation in the U in US? And especially how would you uh, rate its approach or the approach of the Trump administration. You mentioned the politicization um, of disinformation of the issues. So um, how would you assess the current um, situation in the US and what can the US do about it? Yeah, I, I think we've, in to, to not mince words, I think we've really wasted the last four years. Um, there, there was an awakening and a, a building of awareness. Uh, all of that was squandered by the politicization of, of this issue in American society. Um, there, there are a couple of good investments that we've made across the federal government. I think they are too small <laughs> um, and, uh, and unfortunately unable to really address the threat. There is a cell within the Department of Homeland Security uh, that deals with cyber and infrastructure threats. Um, they've done some good work on educating the population, but they're very small, just a couple of people, and they're mostly dealing with threats to our election infrastructure, which, of course, is another huge and connected problem. But again, uh, I would like to see their mandate expanded and, you know, be given more funding. We have a, a group within the State Department that is dealing with this stuff, but because of where the funding comes from for that, they're always focused on uh, audiences abroad, which makes sense because they're in the State Department, but we have a problem here too, and, and that's not investing in the resiliency of, of US populations. And then we've, we've really inexplicably not done very much in terms of the regulatory space, even the simplest nonpartisan solutions that would add a little bit of transparency to the online information environment, like the Honest Ads Act, which is sponsored by uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar, who was one of the candidates for president on the Democratic side, um, as well as Senator Lindsey Graham on the Republican side. The initial bill three years ago when it was first introduced was sponsored by Senator Klobuchar and Senator, Senator McCain. Um, so it has bipartisan support. And what it would do is make uh, online advertising more transparent by giving the same restrictions that we have on our radio, TV, and print ads for campaigns to those online political ads. Right now, those restrictions don't exist. That means that there's no oversight. That means that there are loopholes that bad actors can exploit, whether they're foreign or domestic. Um, and it means that Americans are being targeted with dark ads. They don't know how they're getting to them, who is paying for them, uh, how the targeting is working. And that's really important for for you know, navigating those advertisements. Um, there's a whole other host of issues, but again, we've not even done that simplest step because of the politicization of this crisis. And, and that's a huge, huge problem. When you look at the countries that have done a good job with this or even a, a mediocre job, <laughs> they all have um, that, you know, recognition of the problem as the very first step and we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, so let's switch to the um, questions uh, or the, from the audience, and they basically, you know, um, tie up to what you just explained. So one question I think really is interesting. Um, it says it feels as though Americans are increasingly be losing trust in their democratic institutions, uh, meaning established news publications, universities, 
uh, the CDC, the FDA. So apart from external culprits like Russia, you mentioned, um, who or what is at fault? Oh, wow. We could spend all afternoon talking about that. I mean, partly, I think um, we haven't really talked about the role that journalism plays in all of this yet. Uh, I think the degradation of the local news environment is, is important in this regard because people who are living in America's heartland or um, in, country, in states that don't have um, a really good local news environment, or in some cases, the only local news that they have is their local national public radio or public broadcasting service affiliate. Those are great, but they're severely underfunded. Some states don't even have a reporter on Capitol Hill, which means that, you know, anytime we have conversations that are kind of DC wonky conversations, those aren't getting interpreted through the lens that those local populations need. And with that vacuum, they're seeking out information elsewhere, um, usually from quite spurious uh, sources, which means that, you know, that distrust is getting fomented even more by fringe or distrustworthy media outlets. So that's part of it. But I also, you know, I'm, I'm dismayed to see so many politicians and officials uh, really using these, these kind of narratives that undermine trust in institutions, the very institutions that they seek to serve, that they represent, um, talking about the deep state and things like that, which is a, a thread among conspiracy com communities here in the United States, that there is this secret cabal here in Washington working to undermine the American people. It couldn't be farther from the truth as someone who works with and around public servants every day. Um, and so, you know, I think we really need to invest in putting uh, these these Americans who are just like everybody else uh, out out in front of people. We need our our public servants, officials, to be preaching the you know the gospel of truth rather than one of division and and polarization. It's it's not something that is partisan. I often say that disinformation is a democratic issue, not a partisan one. It can affect both parties equally, and we need every elected official and public servant out there saying that, because right now um, it's become, become too politicized, unfortunately. So you mentioned uh, the responsibility of the media, but also the responsibility um, of the politicians. Let's start with the responsibility of not just the fringe media, as you said, or the fringe um, coverage, but also, you know, more or less the established uh, media. And one question, of course, um, from the audience um, aims at Fox News. So how do you assess the role of Fox News in, in this disinformation or in this information landscape? I think that's what you call it. Yeah, uh, I certainly see Fox News as a problematic source of information that many Americans now rely on. Um, I, there, there are people who specialize in the domestic information environment who have done entire studies on Fox uh, and on the conservative media landscape. Um, Danigal Young has a really great book called Irony and Outrage, and it talks about how on the conservative side of the spectrum, conservative, conservative activists and voters are more motivated by outrage, whereas on the liberal side of the spectrum where we, uh, folks tend to be um, motivated by by humor and, and irony. It's a very interesting book. So I would encourage people to check that out. But um, it certainly plays a role. I think there, there are examples on the left, unfortunately, too, of, of this kind of partisan media environment. Although when we look at um, the top most shared uh, articles on Facebook or other social media, it's often on the conservative side of thing. And again, that's because it deals with those very emotional responses. Um, Fox News and other conservative outlets are expert at manipulating people's emotions and, and just whipping them up into a froth. And I, um, you know, far be it from me to, to talk about uh, Fox's editorial line, but I think it's clear that um, they're not always committed to to the truth. Uh, often when you look at, you know, breaking news and you have all three channels on, uh, Fox News can be covering something totally different than the other two large channels are covering. And that um, speaks to, I think, their their editorial integrity and or lack thereof. Okay, um, looking um, at the other side of the coin, the responsibility of the elected officials. And in this regard, of course, you know, have, you have to look at the people in power. You have to look at the 
perhaps Senate majority. Um, so uh, one question actually is um, about the role of the Conservative Party or the Conservatives in general towards the issue of Russia's influence in American politics. And of course, you always have to look um, at Donald Trump and his apparent sympathetic views towards, you know, countries, um, authoritarian leaders elsewhere. So how do you assess that? What kind of effect does it have on disinformation? Yeah, it's absolutely problematic. And this is something I touch on in the epilogue of the book where I talk about the impeachment process and the disinformation that was being shared about Ukraine uh, and about Russia through Russian narratives that were then entered into the congressional record during the impeachment process. Um, it's it's worrisome. I, I don't, you know, every time... Donald Trump calls the journalists uh, that are, you know, on the front lines of, of protests around the country and around the world fake news. I, I get extremely worried. I think that sends a very bad signal, not only to authoritarians abroad, but to our own American citizens that, you know, journalists are the enemy, which they are clearly not. Um, it, it's a bad example, period. Uh, and not only that, but the, the conservatives, the, the GOP, I know that they care about these issues because I go to Congress and I brief them. I know that they care behind closed doors. I know that people like Lindsey Graham and Mitt Romney and the late John McCain have been to places like Ukraine. And not that McCain was a problem, he was not. <laughs> uh, but uh, but they've some of these senators have changed their tune, right? Uh, they, even though they, they understand the threat that Russia poses, they understand the threat that China poses, they have fallen in line to this a uh, new kind of narrative about, about disinformation and its politicization, when at their core, I do think that they know that, that it is a threat to democracy. So we at the Wilson Center have been working with politicians on both sides of the aisle to try to drive this point home. And I, I do think there is recognition of it. Um, I think unfortunately it will take a little bit of political sea change to really see um, that reflected in, in legislation and in rhetoric on Capitol Hill. Um, on the one side, it's a good thing to hear that it, you know, they actually do care um, about it behind closed doors, but it, it is behind closed doors is on the, you know, is at the same time very, very frustrating. So I have one more question regarding the US. Um, it's a very specific um, question about the US before we um, look towards Europe once more. Um, could you address the disinformation about George Soros being used to polarize the American? Because this is something that is very, you know, very much in, 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 in the spotlight, as you might say. It. Yes, um, it's a very troublesome and uh, persistent narrative that is anti-Semitic, obviously, and has been uh, present in the U.S. media environment for many decades. And again, I'm going to make another book recommendation here. Uh, my friend and colleague Emily Tampkin has a new book out called The Influence of Soros. It is 300 pages all about Soros conspiracy theories. But uh, certainly, you know, Americans love to blame a bogeyman for uh, for our own problems. Again, similarly, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a trend in just blaming Russia for everything. On the other side of the aisle, we have folks who uh, try to blame Soros for everything, for organizing protests, for creating coronavirus, all these things. Uh, again, we like to seek simple answers and pin things on on one one you know superpower human being. Um, it's a very sad thing for me to see, and certainly it's proliferated across a bunch of different conspiracy and disinformation channels on the web. Check out Emily's book if you're interested in more. Okay, uh, let's turn our focus once more back to Europe and Russia's strategy towards Europe. Um, so how would you say is um, or has Russian strategy towards Europe evolved in the light of America's disengagement uh, from the transatlantic partnership under Donald Trump, hashtag America first? And in your opinion, which bigger picture of objectives is Russia currently pursuing vis-a-vis -vis Europe? Oh, big question that I'm not sure we have totally uh, time to answer. I would say that Russia strategy in general hasn't really changed very much because uh, there hasn't been enough of a, um, a response to what Russia is doing. And it's very cheap for them to invest in this sort of thing. So they're going to continue to invest in it to find the fissures in our societies, uh, no matter where we are, not just Europe, not just the West, but also Latin America, Africa, we've seen campaigns 
um, all of this is, is, you know, something that continues to go on and it's, it's going to continue unless we start to craft active deterrence against it. Okay, um, I have one personal question for you, which I find quite interesting before we go to our final round of questions. Um, dealing with what we as individuals can actually do to counter disinformation. And um, let me see, um, no, I haven't found it. Uh, so many questions popping up. Um, just one question, this shouldn't happen. Um, we're alive, so let's deal with it, right? Um, here it is, um, and I find that very interesting. So, knowing that the current presidents of the U of the U.S. and Russia don't tolerate critics gladly, do you ever fear that um, you're toy toying with fire? Would you dare venture to visit Russia following the publication of the book? Uh well, I think I've already been in, in Russia's sites for a little bit uh, because of my work in Ukraine, because of my work with the National Democratic Institute. Uh, I have been to Russia recently, or some, somewhat recently. I went in 2018 as an election observer. Um, and I, you know, if I were able to get a visa, I would certainly uh, go back. Um, I do know that my book, which has been sent to some colleagues in Russia, did not make it through customs. I'm not sure what to read into that. I think perhaps it's just the Russian post uh, being not very good, but but who knows. Um, and I've been, you know, my, my online accounts have been targeted by state-sponsored hackers. I don't know uh, from, from where exactly. Um, but I think I don't, I don't fear for my own safety and I certainly don't fear for my own safety here in the United States, but I'm also not out there covering, uh, protests on the front lines. And I am very disturbed by the, uh, attacks on the free press that we have seen here in the U S I was just tweeting this morning about, uh, it's the anniversary of the, the murder of Pavel Sheremet, who was a journalist in Ukraine. Uh, he was killed four years ago, uh, in a car bomb. Um, and I, I walked by the place where he was killed almost every day when I was in Ukraine. Um, so a reminder of, of you know, the price of, of, of journalism and free speech. Um, but what we've seen over the past two months here in the United States uh, in response to these, these protests and the way that journalists have been treated, particularly journalists of color um, in the black community, uh, I, I'm really disturbed by it. And I don't think it sends a very good signal. So I'm, I'm worried about those folks. I'm not worried for my own safety. I have a fairly, privileged position and I recognize that and instead I'm trying to use that to call out these other abuses that I'm seeing. Uh, so we keep uh, or we we can trust that you will keep on uh, analyzing and putting out such great work um, to counter disinformation. Okay, let's get to our final set of questions which more or less deal with the question what we as individual social media users, what we can do to not spread disinformation. The first question in the set is about education. You mentioned we need more education, we need some kind of media literacy, but um, we also need some kind of information or digital literacy. Um, so do you think one of the core problems is that people actually never learned how to, um, to correctly read information? And could you give examples of countries who succeeded in actually providing the basics for their population in this regard? Sure. Um, so I, as I alluded to before, I think it's less a problem of people not having um, critical thinking skills necessarily and them not having kind of the reflexes they need to correctly assess information online. Um, so again, I think this is more of a problem with, with older folks, uh, the older generations than it is these digital natives. Um, that being said, you know, critical thinking never hurt anybody. So we should always be investing a little bit more in, in that in our education system. But specifically, I would love to see programs in things like public libraries, where, um, you know, actually, in the United States, public libraries are still very highly trusted. So they could serve as a vector uh, for trustworthy information, for these sorts of trainings, for adults, for especially elderly people who need perhaps some computer literacy help. There have been programs like this in the Czech Republic that uh, educate um, you know, grandmas and grandpas basically and how to use their iPad and FaceTime with their grandchildren, but also they sneak in a little bit of 
of, uh, of digital and media literacy. I like to call that the peas and the mashed potato approach, like when you're a kid and, and your mom has to hide your vegetables, right? Uh, they might not sign up for a class on disinformation on its own, but if, if it's packaged this way, they might, might uh, learn something. But when it comes to the actual content of, of this material, um, it should definitely be apolitical and focused on how to recognize if you're being emotionally manipulated, uh, how to recognize if a source is trustworthy or not. So in this regard, I always say to people, look at the website, see if it lists a, uh, a location, like an actual physical address, not a PO box, see if it has a phone number, see if it has a masthead that lists all of the staff, the editorial staff on that publication, see if the author of, of that article that you're reading that seems to be perhaps, you know, distrustworthy, see if that is uh, someone who's, who's published similar articles before. Um, you can also copy and paste a chunk of the text and uh, see if that comes up anywhere on Google, because often with um, like these monetary networks that are used for disinformation for, you know, just um, as kind of ad factories, they will just copy and paste text across a bunch of different websites. Um, so that's, that's a good indication if it's part of a network. Um, and then the last thing that I think is really important that people learn how to do is a reverse image search where you can right click, if you're using Google Chrome, you can right click and search Google for an image to see when the earliest instance of that image is. And this helps you find out if something has been misattributed. You know, often here in the United States, in Washington specifically, when it's hurricane season, and the Potomac inevitably floods, there are always pictures that are shared around online of a shark swimming in the Potomac. But this is clearly photoshopped. A shark can't swim in the Potomac. Um, but every year this happens. And if you were to reverse image search for that image, you would find uh, where this image originally came from and that it was fake. You would get uh, directed to fact checks and things like that. So that's a really useful tool. It's often used a lot in times of crisis. So for instance, uh, in in war torn countries, we saw in Ukraine a lot of Russian disinformation would use um, uh, pictures from from the Balkans in the 1990s to say like this is what's going on in Ukraine today. Those are easily debunked. Um, similar things with with public health crises. Uh, it's a really great tool. So that's an easy way you can do it with Google. And there are also some other tools, including TinEye, uh, TinEye.com, I think. Um, that that's a little bit stronger of a tool if you want to go the extra mile and not just use Google. But that's all really easy. We can do it through libraries. We can do it uh, through, you know, community organizations, um, but they need the funding and support. Uh, Ukraine is another country that's done this. They've had some real success, especially with the library situation. Um, they've done it through secondary schools. And then Estonia is another great example. Finland, Sweden also have invested in this. It's been part of their curriculum in schools long before Russian disinformation was on vogue. Um, and I think that really speaks to the generational power of tools like this if we invest in them, but we're losing ground. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and the good thing is you actually um, already answered the next question I would have asked you um, because you gave us practical advice for average Joe, average Andrea, average Nina on how we can detect this information by you know, taking the time to really look into the sources, to look at the author, to, to question the intention uh, that the author might have have also the technical um, advice you just give, uh, gave us. I have to admit, um, I have never used reverse image because I'm, well, not so much so skilled in this department, I have, I have to admit. But thank you so much for the, um, for the practical advice. And I also want to go back to the, the thing you said in the beginning, informational distancing, something that I, I found quite endearing this concept. So thank you very much for taking the time to answer the questions, to, to speak to us, to speak to our audience. And um, it was a real pleasure. So I can just recommend anybody who's interested in this book, really go out and buy the book. We still have you know, more time than we usually have during the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So you certainly should make sure to buy this book. And once again, many thanks to you, Nina, and many thanks to the America House, many thanks to Bartley. And I give back to Bartley for the last final words. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was a pleasure. Nina, you're a great speaker. That was wonderful. Um, 
And uh, I can only say the book was equally enjoyable to read. I can highly recommend it. Uh, before we go, can I get the program director from America House, Dominic and Johanna, his teammate on to say thank you for the behind the scenes. There we go. These are our directors behind the scenes. Thank you guys. You deserve recognition. Um, everyone should know that America House has officially moved back into their historic building in Munich. It was a three-year extravaganza of renovating. And the gallery opening ceremonies have been postponed because of the pandemic, but their doors are open to the public. So if you're in Munich, do have a look at their website. If there's something that interests you, um, the programs are back on. At least there's a great exhibit you can visit. Um, and I would go back to say, Nina, you close your book offering solutions, which was great, um, and empowering people to be active and engaged members of society. I want to do a plug here also and say it's an election year. And for most of our audience who are, or a lot of the audience are Americans living abroad. And if you are a U.S. citizen abroad, requesting your ballot is easy. You can go to votefromabroad.org. The link is on our Dialogues on Democracy website. And make sure you participate in um, everybody, wherever you are, participate in your democracy so that we keep them healthy and strong. Um, wherever you are, thank you very much for engaging. Um, the time zone we're in is now <laughs> happy hour. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Have a great summer. Our next event is in September. And if we're lucky, it could even be a hybrid in person and uh, virtual event. So watch our website and America's website for more. Andrea and Nina, thank you very much again. And the book, everybody, is How to Lose the Information War, Russia, Fake News, and the Future of Conflict. And I highly recommend it. Cheers. Happy summer, everybody. <laughs>